I hope everyone's awake after their chai. Uh, we're going to start the session with uh, Mark Friedman. Mark Friedman is a second generation financial planner based out of Boston. Before joining his dad in 1990, he was selling Chinese food takeout containers till his girlfriend and now Laura, uh, wife Laura asked him if selling these containers was going to be a career for him. From someone who couldn't tell the difference between a compact disc and a certificate of dis deposit, anyone over here put their hand up, uh, they were both CDs to him. Mark has now uh, spent over 25 years serving more than 450 households and he manages over $300 million. We Won't Rest is the slogan for the Red Sox. Those of you who were in the room earlier, we played the theme song, Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond. And Mark is an avid fan. He seems to have adopted this slogan in his quest to serve the profession of financial planning. Mark is passionate about educating the public as well as financial advisors. He's written two bestsellers, Oversold and Underserved, as well as Retiring for the Genius. I've read Oversold and Underserved, and I can promise you it's really worth a read. He hosts a radio show called Dollars and Cents. Uh, he's a very sought-after speaker, lecturing both internationally and domestically on trends in the financial planning profession and practice management. It's his lifelong dream to dress as a Disney character in Magic Kingdom for just one day. After that, he'd happily retire as a tour guide or guest relations cast member. So now, before he vanishes into the Magic Kingdom, we're privileged that he has flown thousands of miles to talk to us about getting into the heart of client expectations. Please put your hands together for Mark Freedom. <laughs> Louder. Thank you. Hi. How are we doing? Oh, good, because I'm going to move around here a lot. I'm not great behind a podium. I like to have fun. I want you guys to have fun. This is going to be the best hour that you've spent here for the past hour. You're going to have a great time. I traveled from Boston, and as you just recently heard, before I got into this business, I knew nothing about it. I graduated college, a business school called Babson College, the number one school in America for entrepreneurship, and my first job out of college was selling Chinese food takeout containers. Not the greatest job, but I also had one other skill. I was a karaoke host. You've all been to karaoke, haven't you? I used to host those shows, and one night, my wife now came walking into a show asked if she could sing a song with me. We sang a song, and four months later, we were engaged. <laughs> and, today, and in September, we'll celebrate 25 years of marriage. Not a bad thing, right? <laughs> and so it was because of her that she said to me, Mark, are you sure you want to be selling Chinese food takeout containers for the rest of your life? And I said, I don't know. She says, why don't you see what your father does for a living? I knew my father was a financial planner, but I didn't quite understand what financial planning was. I didn't know anything. Like, she, like you said, I didn't know the difference between a certificate of deposit, which is a timed deposit, and a compact disc. They were both CDs to me. So I approached my next career looking at it like this. Now, my dad would have understood that, or you understand that, right? Me? Funny thing is, the first day we got here in India, we arrived here on Saturday, we asked our tour guide, I showed her the slide, and I said, I'm going to be using this slide in a presentation. Is there anything offensive here? <laughs> I didn't know. So she says, no, that's a normal eye chart. So as I grew in the business, this is what the eye chart started to look like. Things were a little blurry. Things were a little blurry. And then over time, we started to fine-tune everything. 
We'd put on the lenses, we'd twist them a little bit, and soon everything started to become clear. Today, you're facing some blurriness, some uncertainty. You don't know the next direction of where your career will go. <coughs> Excuse me. But I can tell you, I have seen the future, and it's amazing. I have seen the story that you're living in right now happen in America. I've seen it happen in Holland. I've seen it happen in Germany, in Austria, in Luxembourg, in Brazil, in Singapore, in Thailand, in Fiji. I've been to all of those places and spoke to audiences just like yours. And I look at your opportunity here, and it is bigger and better than any of the opportunities that I have yet to see. But it's scary. You just don't know what's going to happen. But I'll tell you this. One thing to remember is we are all ordinary people. But we're faced with an extraordinary task. And if you're willing to take on this extraordinary task, boy, you're going to be rewarded. You see, in America, where this industry, the financial planning and investment management industry, is relatively mature. Yes, it's going through its series of changes. But they have defined these, these categories, this ultra high net worth category, the high net worth category, the middle market. Now we get down to the women's market or the next generation, which is really young, millennials. But I will tell you, whatever conference you go to, whether you go to the States, whether you go to a conference in Europe, here in Asia, wherever it is, everybody wants to tell you about serving the high net worth investor. I am telling you, don't waste your time. Serving the high net worth investor is like elephant hunting. It's too difficult. But serving the middle market is not profitable. We still need to make a living. But there is a market that so desperately wants to hear from you and they will tell you everything because they will absolutely adore you and they are called the mass affluent. And this is the growing segment that is happening right here in India every single day. And amazingly in America, nobody wants to say that they serve them. Isn't that inter interesting? When you go to a US conference, everybody talks about serving the high net worth investor. All my life, since 1991 when I started in this business, I've served the mass affluent market. And people think I'm crazy. Mark, you're missing out on such a huge opportunity. This is the opportunity because these are the clients. They will never leave. They love you. They will tell you everything. They'll invite you to parties, to weddings. You'll get invited everywhere. You'll want to spend time with them. <coughs> no, they won't be friends. They'll be businesses. They'll be clients. But it'll be a relationship unlike anything. A perfect example is on my way here. On my way here today, I mean, not today, this, on the flight, I landed and I received notice that a client of mine had died. What's interesting, I was her first call. We are generally the first call when a client dies. Ask yourself, where are you on the hierarchy? of your clients when somebody dies. When will they call you? I was, the I was the first email, I should say, that I got from them. So, here's what the mass affluent want from you. Number one reason, and we just did this branding study of my office. We surveyed all of our clients. And by the way, I think we can make this presentation available to you guys somehow electronically. I'm happy to share it. The number one item that my client said, the reason that they love doing business with our firm is that we care deeply. Wouldn't you love for that to be the first couple words that came out of your client's mouths when they asked about why do they do business with you? They said they like working with us because we give them reassurances. We tell it like it is, but we take it very seriously. We always focus on the big picture. And you know what? We don't let emotions get in the way. Our job as financial planners, your job as financial planners, is to manage your clients' expectations. That's what you need to do. 
it would be a great theme for next year's conference called Managing Expectations. Because that's what you are going to need to do in a year of tremendous change in India. Over the next five to ten years, I will tell you, those that are in this business, if you're still in the business ten years from now, imagine your life totally different than it is now. You will be looked upon as the leaders of industry. You will be looked upon as the most, the, the most embracing, the most, um, the most confident, but the most connected to your clients. You will see the number of in mutual funds over the next 10 years grow unlike you've ever seen before. When my father joined, got into the business back in the 1970s, there were 200 mutual funds. Today in America, there are 20,000. 20,000 mutual funds to choose from. How do you choose from 20,000 mutual funds? You know what the world has realized and what I've realized? Products no longer matter. It's the client that matters. A fund is a fund is a fund is a fund. What you want to do is partner up with supporters like these or others that you know and partner up with them deeper than just their intellectual capacity, deeper than what they do as investment advisors, I mean as investment managers. What you need from them is a marketing department. You need to turn to them to give you ideas on practice management, on how best to turn around and ex explain some of the concepts they're doing in a language your clients can understand. Because that's what they want. Clients don't want to be blown away by fancy jargon. They want to be talked to in a language they can understand. So, so take a look at this. This is a picture of my family. Now I want you to look at them in a perspective of a puzzle, because that's what it is, a puzzle. What are the most important pieces when putting together a puzzle? Go ahead, what do you think the most important pieces are when you put together a puzzle? Anybody? The what? The, the big frame, the... The corners, thank you, the corners, yeah. Financial planning, though, is like a puzzle. Because the most important piece when putting together a puzzle, when doing financial planning for a client, is you need the cover of the box. When you put together a puzzle for a client, you need to see the big picture first, rather than the, the granular pieces of each puzzle. Yeah, there are key corners. Those corners might be anchors, they might be goals. But there's a lot of pieces that could change. They all kind of look similar, and it's up to you to continue to refer to the cover of the box to understand what your client's situation looks like and how unique it is to anything else that you're doing. You see, the question of... Oops. Did I go too far here? Hold on. Let me do one thing here. Okay. We'll go there. The question is, how do your clients view you? What do they see? If I were to ask my clients, what do they see of you when they think of a financial planner? What do they think of? You know what they think of? They view you like this. You're the investment guy. You're the insurance girl. They don't view you as their financial planner. They basically go to you for investment advice, for insurance advice. But when I've asked you, what do you do as financial planners, that's not how you see yourself, is it? But that's how your clients see you. But you know what? Your clients want to see you a different way. This is how they want to see you. They want to see you as a person that sees financial planning being at the core of everything you do. Financial planning isn't an investment. It isn't a mutual fund. It isn't better performance than the next. And an investment or insurance solution isn't always the answer to a client's problem. How do you tell a client whether, how they should go about buying a car or maybe paying for their children's education when it's time to actually pay it? How do you tell them how, whether they're spending too much? How do you help them understand what the right tax liabilities they should be paying based upon the income that they have. 
Is there an investment answer for those things? No. What do you do when a client calls and says, my husband just died? What investment product is there to sell now? Nothing. They want advice. They want empathy. They want to see that you care. That's when you're doing financial planning. You see, I had this meeting. <coughs> we have this client advisory council. The client, I got it up here. We can get some, don't worry. Thanks. So we've got this client advisory council. I've had it for 20 plus years. The client advisory council is made up of 12 of our clients. Not our best clients, not our favorite clients. It's made up of 12 clients and their spouses who represent the demographics of my firm. And each year, a couple times a year, we take them out for dinner. And we don't use it as a place to show them a new product. We don't bring in a mutual fund company to tell them about the future of the economy. We ask them, what is it that we're doing well and what could we be doing better? And when you ask these people, if you ask the right people, they'll tell you. And one of the things that's important about a client advisory council is the fact that when you bring people into a room to tell them and to ask for opinions, you better be offering financial planning the same way with the same philosophy to everyone in the room. Because if you do things differently for each of these people, the solution, the product might be different, but the client first attitude is hopefully the same for all. Now you can get an engaged conversation. So I asked this client, this was in 2009. You may remember that time. It was not a great time in the US economy, nor was it around the world. We had the credit crisis. In fact, when I saw many of, some of you actually, um, I was chairing the Financial Planning Association's National Conference in Boston. It was 2008. There were 3,000 financial advisors in this room. And I came out dressed as Manny Ramirez from the Boston Red Sox, and I was hitting baseballs, soft baseballs, out into the audience. Not hard ones, you'd hurt yourself. But at the same time, the stock market had dropped 2,500 points that day, or two, over that weekend. People were scared. And so we decided to host a meeting for our client advisory council a couple weeks thereafter the conference. Because it wasn't pretty. People would get their investment statements and it would be less. People were losing their jobs and they were scared. People worried about, could I afford to help out my kids? Could I afford to put food on the table? What would I do? And so we hosted a dinner with these 12 clients and their spouses. So I asked a bold question. I asked, and imagine asking your clients this question. Every month for the past 14, 15 months, You've opened your statements, and the value has been less, and less, and less, and less, and less. Someone referred to it as kind of like the cheese grater approach. It hurt every month. It was slicing another piece. Ah! Slicing it along. So I asked my clients, why do you stay? Why are you still with us? Think about that. Could you imagine? Asking your clients that very question. Well, a gentleman raised his hand and he says to me, Mark, I'm a retiree and when I came to you, I used to do all of my investing on my own. And I knew that I wanted to enjoy retirement to its fullest. And I turned to my wife, and we agreed we were going to hire a financial planner, and we hired you and your father. He says, but I will tell you that the reason that I stay today, almost 10 years after we hired you, is totally different than the reason I hired you back then. He says, you see, this past week, I learned I have terminal cancer. My doctor has told me I have six months to live, and I need to get my affairs in order very quickly. And my wife here, Joyce, who you know, comes to meetings every time with me. But she never says a word. She sits quietly and she listens. Because I've always taken the responsibility of managing the household. 
but in six months that's not going to be possible. And so I worry for her. And so we talked about what is our future? What is your future, Joyce, going to look like when I'm no longer here? And she said one thing to me, don't fire the Freedmans. Pretty interesting. This is what this guy's saying. He's standing up. I mean, my head's growing like this, right? I mean, how good do you feel? But how sad do you feel? Interestingly enough, let's fast forward. Dick never died. Dick is still alive today. And last month, Joyce died. You never know what's going to happen. What the doctor says isn't necessarily what's going to come true. But you have to be there as their guide, as their shepherd, moving them along, moving them along, and being there with empathy to help them. Well, you think that might have been a great story. But it's the second story that came out of that meeting that was even more impressive. A gentleman by the name of Stan, and these stories, I guess, are in my book. I don't know if you've picked up the book. It's called Oversold and Underserved. Both of these stories are in the book. <clears throat> he stands up in the meeting, and he says to me, Mark, you know, I, I retired from Raytheon. Familiar with the firm at Raytheon? Anybody ever hear that? It's a defense company in America. Some of you have heard of it. And I was in their marketing department. And he says, when you asked that question, the first thing that I thought about is, how would I illustrate what does financial planning look like? What does financial planning look like? And he says, I want you to imagine this. He stands up and he says, I want you to imagine the silhouette of a human body on a black screen and a white silhouette. And all of a sudden, in the, difference, in the distance, you hear the beat of a heart. And as that heart grows louder, you start to see it on the screen. And it starts getting louder. And the, system, and the circulatory system continues to grow out. And it fills into the fingers. And it travels down to the toes. And he says, that's financial planning. I said, I don't get it. Huh? He says to me, I want you to think of this. Many people hire an investment guy, an insurance guy, or they have several investment people. They have a banker. They have a tax person. They have an attorney. If I bought an investment, and, this, and this, my thumb represents the investment, and this investment goes bad, what happens? The heart when you get hurt, the heart compensates for everything else. To make sure that everything else is remaining healthy while we're, hurt, while we're dealing with this ailment right here. Who do I call when I'm upset about my investment? I call my stockbroker. But who do I call to make sure that the rest of my body is running, running well, that my heart continues to pump blood to all of the other areas of my body? I call my financial planner. Because my stockbroker over here, he doesn't know anything about this. I thought it was interesting. And so it made me think, <coughs> what is the formula for financial planning? If we're truly going to place the interest of our clients first, mustn't we know more about financial planning than we do about investments? Of course. So what I decided to do is I hired my friends from MIT and Harvard to develop a formula for financial planning. And it looks like this. No, I didn't hire guys from MIT or Harvard. They're too smart for me. But that's what I came up with. Everyone get it? We'll move on. No, I'm kidding. This is what it's all about. Let me, let me back up here one slide. What happened here? Hold on. All right. All right, so the foot. Come on, Mark. Button's really sensitive here. Come on. It's like on a delay. I'm not sure which one I'm doing here. All right, everyone good? There we go. All right, so let me explain to you what this is now. We're going to break this down into three parts. The secret and the success of doing the formula for financial planning includes three components. And my feeling is, is if you're not doing all three of these components, you are not 
delivering financial planning. Component number one, DY stands for discovery. I'm going to show you some of the details in a second. The second one is what's called capital protection. And the third, the WM, stands for wealth management. Let's jump into each one of them. All right, here's discovery. If you can't answer these questions, or you haven't been asking and probing these questions of your clients, I don't believe you've done the proper job to get started in financial planning. Number one, what, understand clearly what goals have you set for yourself. Is a goal of, I want to retire a goal? No. What does retirement look like? Now there's a better question. Tell me what retirement looks like to you. Is that a different type of a question than what are your goals? I want to retire. Okay. And what other goals do you have? No, let's dig a little deeper. We could dig a lot deeper. For those of the, you, that, you know, um, that know George Kinder, George Kinder, a friend of mine from Cambridge, I understand he was out here recently. George uses his Evoke program to dig deeper. Sometimes I think that's going too deep. I don't know if you make any money that way. I think you spend more time trying to figure out the heart of it all. You ultimately have to stop and, and do business. But George has a really interesting approach. Number two, what challenges do you face? Ask your clients, what are the biggest challenges standing in your way right now? But where have you found your greatest success? Because oftentimes clients will be thinking about replicating the successes that they've had. And you've got to be careful of that. Sometimes their success was they bought this stock that tripled in value. And that's what they want to do again. Well, that's luck. Folks, that's luck. And where do opportunities exist in your life? Maybe you're up for a promotion. Maybe there's a marriage that's coming. Maybe there's an inheritance that's coming your way. All important things for you to know before you start to invest any money, right? Second one, capital of protection. How can we do financial planning? How can we expose our clients' money to risk if we're not certain that they've protected their life, their family, their wealth, and their legacy? How can we do that? It's one of the mistakes that happens in America, by the way. America is one of these countries where it's more important to make money and to, to make money, to talk about how much money you're making and to show it all off than it is to capture some of that money, preserve it, and protect it. Did you know that in America the average savings rate is 5%? 5%. And the average income in America is far higher, of course, than it is in India. I think you know that. But even people that are making $200,000, $500,000 in America, they're spending it. Let me give you an example. We have clients in our office that need to spend, and I'm, I'm not converting this to rupees, and I apologize for that. We have some clients that are very happy living on $1,500 a month for expenses, and others that couldn't imagine spending less than $20,000 a month. What's right? So I always tease my kids with the question, what is a lot of money? Everybody says, oh, I make a lot of money. Or he's doing really well in his job. What does that mean? As far as I'm concerned, what you make means nothing to me. It's what you keep that matters. What you make means nothing. It's all about what you keep. And then when you have some stuff that you've kept, then we focus on the wealth management part of this whole equation. But when we're looking at client first, it's not about what you can invest. It's not about what you can save. It's about owning and understanding everything that you have, your total net worth. If you aren't crafting a net worth statement, meaning bank accounts, gold, real estate, investments, liabilities, things that they own, things that they owe, if you're not crafting all of that, on a net worth statement for your clients before you ever invest for them, how can you truly say you're placing their interest first? Think about that. If someone were to walk into your office and say, I have 50 luck to invest, can you make some recommendations for me? And if your inclination is to say, oh, let me, let me show you some of our products that we have available, 
you are not placing the interests of clients first. You're just another salesman. I want you to imagine sitting in a courtroom in the witness stand trying to defend the fact that you placed a client's interests first when you didn't know about everything they owned and everything they owed you only knew about the investment and the investment you sold them didn't perform all that well but you still believe you placed the interest of the client first you lose easy so let's be careful before well, we start throwing around the words placing the interest of clients first or the words fiduciary let's be sure that you can stand behind it and mean it that's important that's the critical element of, of becoming a successful financial planner who truly puts client first that's what it truly means in wealth management also you need to know how much money is coming into the house how much money is going out of the house and what's the net amount that's saved you need to assume some growth rates and you need to consider inflation so this is how it all looks in a big picture if i can move that up there yeah the power of financial planning so what we're trying to do here is trying to get our equation now it's with words we take the discovery part the discovery includes goals and challenges and successes the capital protection includes under protecting the life family wealth and legacy and wealth management says net worth and cash flow now some people might ask me mark what about taxes we have to consider taxes don't we but let me go back here i'm going to go back to that equation here of wealth management yeah so here's what i've done with the wealth management component i believe that the net cash flow when you get down to net cash flow how much money is available to be saved you've already deducted taxes from it already so why do I need to have a separate line in this formula for taxes? Taxes is part of net cash flow. So that's why I've used it that way. It's my formula. Feel free to use it. Make up your own. Do whatever you want with it. It was something that I came up with one day, but it has become the core. We ask ourselves, and wouldn't it be cool if your clients came to you with a card that looked like that looked like that, and that's how they measured you as a successful financial planner? What if they could put a little check mark above each one of those words to say, okay, now I can say I got financial planning. Pretty cool. It's the way I've approached it. So what I want to do is I want to pull back the curtain a little bit. I want to show you how we place the interests of clients first. And this is what we do. I have this secret ingredient that we call in our office ECR squared. Here are the basic principles of what we do for a successful relationship how many people here have clients that you can't stand all right there's a few hands how many people have clients that just drive you absolutely insane and you go what am i doing with these people you all have them right we all got them well we have a rule in our office everybody always asks there's a big question in america they say well what's your minimum What's your minimum? Meaning, what's your minimum amount of money to invest? Here's my minimum. Do I like you? And do you like me? Imagine if that was your minimum. Do I like you? And do you like me? After that, we decide what the type, the scope of work is that we need to do for our clients. No, we're not going to take on everybody. We have a good sized practice now. But the first part is, do I like them? And you know what? If I like them, I'm willing to make some exceptions on lowering the amounts of money I might deal with. But I'm not going to lower the amounts if I don't like the people. Because did you ever find that some of your smallest clients are the biggest pains in the neck? And your biggest clients are some of the best clients you've ever had? We make the mistake of accepting the wrong clients. That is our fault, not their fault, our fault. So the first thing we have to say, do we, are we going to enjoy this relationship? And if we do, we can now engage them. We can engage them in dialogue. We can engage them in the formula for financial planning. Now, once we've gathered all of that data and we've put it all together, things that I collect, for instance, if people are going to hire me to do financial planning, I collect from you, here's a bunch of items. Number one, a copy of your pay stub. Number two, 
Six months of bank statements that show all the money going in and all the money going out. Now, what's interesting is I know a lot of India has been in a cash-based society. So it's kind of difficult to track that, isn't it? Well, it looks like our friend Mr. Modi has tried to clean that up a little bit. So hopefully you'll be able to see where their money's going. Because how can you truly place their interest first if you don't know what's really coming in and really going out, right? <coughs> so we get the bank statements. Copy of all of their investment statements, retirement plan statements. Copy of any benefits booklets that are provided by their employer. Maybe they get health insurance or some type of life insurance through work. Any personal life insurance, disability insurance, homeowner's insurance, automobile insurance. Copy of any estate planning documents. Statements about accounts for their children. The list goes on and on. They need to bring that. We do a financial plan. We coordinate all that stuff to be sure that we understand who they are so that we can build that net worth statement. Then we communicate it out to them. We say, here's where you are today, and here's what the various scenarios might look like for achieving that goal. We put everything in writing. We don't just say it, we write it. And one of the things that I've learned, actually I've read some of the newspapers over the past few days, and they do a really nice personal financial columns in some of the newspapers, and, um, and Outlook Money, I, I read your magazine last night, and I thought this is great. This is fabulous for an emerging population. They need to understand this. But one of the things that I think we all need to be careful, you especially, need to be careful about, and it's something that I'm not allowed to do, is you can't use words like will. I will do this. Or you can get this. Or I promise this. You should remove those words from your vocabulary. Because sooner or later, the regulators and compliance departments will come down and they will say no more. You could say, you might consider this, this could happen, this may happen, not will, not can. You will get yourself in a lot of trouble, especially if I'm telling you to put things in writing. And you should put things in writing. The last thing that our clients love and the reason why we have a 99% retention rate, the only way we lose clients is they die. The reason that they love us is because we remember what we're supposed to do for them. We gather all of the date details. We keep record of it. We have a great contact management system. So we remember everything about them. And when they come in for the next meeting, we talk to them about what we talked about last time. We check in, oh, how was that vacation you went on? What happened? How, how did your daughter's uh, birth with their child go? How did the move work out? We remember those things. And that way we retain them. So that's our secret ingredient. But here, let me show you a couple other things. Someone earlier said, financial planning is a contact sport. I love that. I'm thinking about using that on my radio show. The only way you can do financial planning successful is eyeball to eyeball. If you think you can do financial planning successfully as a robo-advisor, you're wrong. But you can invest money through a robo-advisor. You can certainly do that. But if you're into doing financial planning, you should stop doing it over the phone, stop doing it over the internet, eyeball to eyeball. Now I've seen the traffic out here. It ain't easy to get around. And I don't know how some of you guys drive in that traffic. So maybe you think about building your client base within the local area of where you live. 90% of my clients live within 20 kilometers of my house and my office. They all come to my office. We don't do evening appointments. We don't do weekend appointments. There are other financial advisors that are happy to do that. Now, if you're starting right now, you're going to take weekend appointments. You're going to take evening appointments. I get that. We are a mature practice. But that's what you should be shooting for. Imagine being able to have a practice that runs similar to a doctor's office. How often are your doctors open late at night or on the weekends? You find time during the day to see them. Your clients should see the importance of your money and view you the same way. When you're viewed that way, you truly are their financial planner. They will find time to come and see you. Second thing you need to do is get their financial house in order. That's what your clients need. They don't need another investment product right now. What they need is a net worth statement so they can see where they stand financially. 
Because once they can see where they stand financially, then they take a portion of that money, a portion of that money, and start investing it with you. Third thing we need to do is to realize that we don't need sophisticated investments for the mass affluent. Ma investing is not hard, and please don't ever let a client believe that investing is hard. It is not. It does not take rocket science, despite the fact that you'll have plenty of economists, portfolio managers, CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, whatever it is, telling all these sophisticated investment strategies. Investing is easy, folks. Investing is easy. Let me ask someone, how many think people here think they're pretty good at picking investments? How many people, raise your hand if you think you're pretty good at picking investments. Well, look at that. You got a few hands. How'd you feel it if your clients were all sitting up here right now? <clears throat> well, maybe you know the truth. Because the truth is, picking investments is not your job. Picking investments is the job of a portfolio manager. And if you think you're really good at picking investments, get out of the financial planning business. You're in the way of somebody else. Go work for a mutual fund company. Be that portfolio manager. But financial planners know that being good at picking investments is not where you want to spend your time because if you really are good at it, you need to spend that time 24-7 doing it. Let the managers do it. Let the professionals partner with your supporters, partner with the mutual fund companies, partner with the insurance companies. That's where the intelligence is. That's where these people are doing this 24-7. So what I want you to do instead is to build a SWOT analysis. Try to craft a SWOT analysis for every single one of your clients. What are their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Imagine if you built that and you shared this with your clients at the next meeting. Based upon our conversation, Mr. and Mrs. Client, I've been doing a lot of thought, thinking, and here's where I view are some of your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What do you think? Wow, they've just now seen that you've done some caring and some thoughtful thinking. And what a dialogue you could have with them. How'd you like it if we started to update that SWOT analysis each time we met? You contribute to it, we contribute to it, we work on that. Every single one of my clients has a SWOT analysis that is live and living in my office. Here's another one. Communicate. When someone says to me, hey, could you send me some information about your firm? What do you send them? You say, oh, go to my website, here's my card. Maybe you want to send them something. We have an information kit that we send. We do a memo to file, which means that after every meeting, I dictate what happened in the meeting. I also dictate a letter to the clients that thanks them. Thanks for being here. Here's what we talked about today. And then we do what is called a review and recap letter. After every review meeting, it's a short little letter that says, here's what we discussed today. Clients love that we communicate with them. The next thing we have is what we call our 72 points of communication. Could you imagine telling your clients, because one of the reasons, the number one reason clients leave advisors is because they don't hear from you. It's the number one reason clients leave and they go somewhere else. Well, we have a rule of 72 points of communication. Now, this is kind of easy. How many of you get my newsletter? How many people here in the room have gotten my newsletter? There's a few of you. All right, if you want to get my newsletter, it is free. You go to my website, freedmanfinancial.com. That's Friedman to ease and a D, financial.com. You'll find that. If you want my information, come see me. You sign up for it every week. Every week. Well, it's 10.30 in the morning, my time on Friday, that we do it. We've been sending it out since 2009. Over 7,000 of them go out, all with little tidbits, financial planning tidbits and ideas. You're all welcome to use the tidbits, share them, do them, whatever you want with them. But I'd love to have you sign up for it if you want. So that's 52 weeks, right? My clients also get unlimited reviews. Mostly we meet with our clients once or twice a year. If they want to meet more, they, that's fine. We also send them 12 monthly statements. They get four performance reports. We invite them to client events. We're always available via the phone and the, or email. And there's always, always, always at my office a live voice that answers the phone during regular business hours. That's what happens. That's called great communication. A couple other things that we do. This is what the newsletter looks like. Little pieces of it. We're also very visible in our community. I'm very active in the theater group that's in our community. We do the posters for them to promote the show. It's just a great little thing that we do. But as we round up, I got eight minutes here. And I'm going to go through in eight minutes my 10 keys for clients first, products next. Here's my 10 keys. 
And I will tell you this, after my presentation, I'm sticking around here through lunch. So if you want to catch up with me, you want to ask some questions, want to talk a little bit, I'm around, I'm available. I'd love to meet any and all of you. If you want to exchange information, happy to do that. If you want anything, just come find me, okay? I, I really want to make myself available to you. I've traveled all this way from Boston. I've got to do something, right? So actually, I'm with my wife, so I can do some things. Um, Ten keys for client first, products next. Of course, number one, use that formula for financial planning. Think about it, use it, apply it. Figure out how you can do it. Maybe it doesn't work for all of your clients, but maybe you try it with your best five. Try it with those first. Give it a shot. Number two. This is a big one. There are going to be times, well, you just had some interesting times, with the demonetization of cash, of money. I bet that was a pretty emotional time for all of you and for your clients. But did your clients turn to you for reaction to their emotion or a rational behavior? They wanted you to be rational during those very emotional times. That's what they were paying you for. I want you to remember that no matter what happens over the next five, ten years in this country, there will be successes and there will be some big challenges. Your test of survival if you're going to be around 10 years from now in this profession, if you can remain rational during emotional times and not fall into the scare tactic of, this time's different, we got to do something different, don't do it. No matter how bad things got in America, I never sold out. Never. And I could never imagine selling out. Could you imagine never selling out? Ask yourself that. Could you imagine never selling out for your clients? Think about it. It's going to be tough, but that's where leaders are born. That's where ordinary people take on an extraordinary task. Number three, focus on client goals, not on performance. Stay away from performance. Look, I'm hearing things up here about earning 15% rates of return, 11% rates of return. Folks, that's not likely to continue. And if you're using those numbers as models for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you are lying to your clients. You are lying to your clients. The only guarantee that you can make to your clients when you show them a projection of what their money will be worth, unless it's in a guaranteed investment, is that this will never happen. Imagine sharing a financial planning analysis to a client saying, sorry, this will never happen. And it has nothing to do with investment performance either. Maybe they'll lose their job. Maybe they'll get a bigger promotion. Maybe someone will die. Those things happen. Ask yourself, how many things are different in your life 10 years ago than they were today? Lots! In America, when people say to me, Mark, what can I expect for a rate of return on my portfolio? Your expectation is between 6 to 8%. 6 to 8%. That is all. That is all. And people are like, really, I can do that well? Because all they can get at the bank is zero. If you want to get a term deposit, one of these time deposits you might have, maybe 5 or 6% here in India, you know what you get for that? 0.1%. That's what it is in America. That's what it is in America. We expect growth of U.S. equities to grow at a rate of about 6 to 8% annually. We expect bonds to be basically flat because we have very low interest rates. And if interest rates go up, what happens to bonds? They go down. So imagine that. So people are actually happy and satisfied with a 4 and 5% rate of return. That's what you need to prepare yourself for 5 to 10 years from now. Seriously, think about that. I want you to document everything. Every conversation you have with a client, make sure you write it down. I want you to delegate. Here's the key. You want to be successful, hire somebody. Stop doing everything yourself. Yeah, but that takes money out of my pocket. That's right. But how many successful businesses do you know that are run by one person? You got to find that you're going to focus on what you do well and hire somebody to do everything else for you. That's what is really the key to success here. A couple other things here. Steer the ship. Don't let it steer you when your clients tell you, when your client tells you, you need to do this. You make sure that, you're, that they're acting rationally. 
Sometimes the best advice you can tell your client is to stop doing this. Do you want to take the personal liability and responsibility if you do something that the client asked of you to do, but you didn't agree with it? Now, some might say, well, my job is to place the interest of my client first. And if that's what my client wanted to do, I'm going to do it. And if that's the case, you make sure that you put down in writing that this is what the client's wishes were. It's not necessarily what you may have recommended, but you did it through the idea of I needed to place my client's interests first. This was important. It was important for them, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Put it in writing, get the client to sign off on it. Also, be visible in your community. Look, if you want to build a community practice where 90% of your clients live within 20 kilometers of your office, you better be visible. Get involved in whatever religious organization you're in. Get involved in philanthropy. Be involved in your town, in sports, in the schools, whatever it is. Just get involved. But more than anything else, be part of this. How about Sadiq? I mean, has he built something here great? I mean, I think this is really tremendous. This is, this is really amazing. I met Sadiq years ago, and I will tell you, some of the greatest visionaries exist in this room right now. Sadiq's clearly one of them. I don't know everybody here, but if you guys can see the future, if you can live, your in, you can live with your business with one foot in the present and one foot in the future and find that balance, man, are you going to be successful. Great things are yet to come. The next thing you need to do is hone your leadership skills. Read books about leadership. I got you. She's great, by the way. She's my little number person. You're doing a great job. I feel like I'm in a boxing match. You know. Hone your leadership skills. Read books about leadership. Find true leaders and find out what true leaders did. Now, look, I'll mention the word Trump, and I'll get a variety of different reactions here, right? Look, I, you know, there's an interesting thing about Trump. Trump, can I take like two minutes more? Is that okay? Or do I have to hard stop here? Can I take two more minutes? I know. Okay. One thing about Trump is not many people are fans of Donald Trump as a person, but a lot of people are fans of the message. The message. Donald Trump is, could be an absolute disaster, his favorite word, or he could be an absolute hero. But that's what leaders do. Leaders take risk. Leaders take chances. They don't care what everybody else says. They fight the battle and they deal with the consequence. I think the world needs to take a couple steps back and breathe a little bit and see what happens. This could be a fabulous leader down the road or a fabulous disaster. We will soon see. Surround yourselves with people that, sm that are smarter than you always do that. Find your leaders, find your mentors, find people. You know what? Don't try to build a business on your own. Be careful about that. Don't build a business on your own. Join firms. Be part of a team. Share your expect ex expertise. That's important. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than with you. And then lastly, share your portfolio. Yep, I said it. Share your portfolio. Woo! I don't know, that could be tough. Sharing the portfolio. What do you think of that? Well, <laughs> oh, you thought I was talking about money? Oh, you got to share this portfolio. That's the portfolio you should focus on. That's what you got to tell about. Stop being so one-sided. Laugh with your clients. Be part of your clients. Engage with your clients. Tell them stories. Hey, listen to their stories. Because your success is their success. And that's how everything works, by sharing your portfolio. Bring them into your life. You bring their life into yours. Have them bring their life into yours. And together, you will place clients first. Products will come next. But you will find enormous success in the years to come. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. Wow, standing ovation, huh? Wow. Shepherd Mark. At least they're not throwing things at me. That's a good thing. Uh, you forgot the you forgot the baseball. Oh yes, I did. I forgot the baseball. Thing. They could have thrown that at you. Hey, I got a question. Just out of curiosity, I spend a lot of time watching cricket. I've been trying to learn about cricket. Is that ball hard or soft? <laughs> it's hard. I don't know how those guys catch it with their bare hands. That's got to hurt. I'm sorry. That's just curious. Shepard Mark, your passion for this profession has lit a fire in all of us. We'll aim to have one foot in the present and one in the future. I'd like to invite Yogita to please present Mark with a token of our appreciation, eyeball to eyeball. Put your hands together for Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you. Yeah. Where it began, I can't begin to know it.